Well, good morning. I am very glad that you're all here today. Um, glad to see all your guys' faces. Um, thanks for being here today. If you haven't been with us in the last couple of weeks, uh, we've been going through the short book of Jonah. And so those of us, those of you that might be visiting here today, I'd just like a, to maybe recap some of the stuff that we've been going through. So, so far, this is what we've seen. God calls his prophet Jonah to go to Nineveh to preach a message he doesn't want to preach. And so he says no, and he runs the other way. He goes on a ship heading to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. So the Lord hurls a great storm on the sea after that ship. Now the sailors on the ship, they recognize that this is not a normal storm. This is something supernatural. So what they do is they, draw, they cast lots. The Lord allows the lot to fall on Jonah, pointing him out as the one responsible for this storm that God is sending on them. And so they, they question him. They grill him. Who are you and what are you doing? He says, well, I'm a Hebrew and I'm running from the God of heaven, the creator of heaven and earth, the Lord of the sea and the dry land. And they said, well, what are we, what, what are we supposed to do to make this storm stop? Jonah says, well, you got to throw me over. These sailors don't want to do that. So they row as hard as they can to get back to the land, but the storm continues to grow worse. Pretty soon they're left with no option. So they cry out to the Lord in prayer. They say, Lord, please forgive us what we're about to do. And they throw Jonah over the side into the raging seas. You can imagine how terrifying that would have been for anybody in the middle of this storm. And especially for a Hebrew a Hebrew man, because the Hebrew people believed that the underworld or Sheol was an actual physical place under the earth. It was a kind of a watery prison. And once you were there, you were there. There was no getting out. They actually believed that the chaos of the seas meant that you were getting close to the land of Sheol. I mean, the sea can be a scary place, especially in a storm. Even on a calm day, the sea can be a scary place. When I was 13 years old, I was in a youth group and I grew up in Southern California. So the beach was close. And so we took a trip to the beach and we camped out for a couple nights and I was young. I was unaware of the power of the ocean. I was pretty athletic and I was always able to conquer things physically. So I took risks bigger than I really should have. And I went farther and farther out into the ocean. And so there I was, I was boogie boarding and, and that's, a board that you kind of body surf on is about that wide and maybe about that long and has curved to it. It's slick bottom, has a leash on the front that you attach to your wrist and you ride the waves on it. And so I'm out there riding and all of a sudden out of nowhere behind my head, I feel I get pushed under by a wave. I'm terrified because I'm under and it's a powerful wave. I'm getting tossed all around. I don't know which way is up. And not only that, I feel me going one way out away from the ocean from the shore, my board going towards the shore and the leash snaps. Now I'm getting worried because yeah, I can swim, but I can't touch bottom where I'm at. And when you're in the ocean, it's nice to have something to rest on when you get tired. So what happened was wave after wave would crash down on me. I would finally find my way up to the surface. I would take a breath and there would be another way of pushing me under spinning me, churning me in the water, I could not find my way up. Now, there were people close by. There were people out there with me in the water. I could have called out to for help. But I was too prideful. I was too embarrassed to admit that I needed help. I'm serious. I was so prideful, even facing death, I did not want to cry out for help. Eventually, I realized I was in trouble. I couldn't breathe. I finally came up for a breath. I had a second and I yelled, help, as loud as I could. It was probably pretty weak. There was a girl not too far from me. She turned and looked at me. And when she turned and looked at me, I felt such shame that I pointed towards my board that was at the shore, like as if that's what I needed help with. Can you just get that for me? Well, miraculously, my mom and my stepdad, Randy, were on the shore watching us. They had seen my condition they were already making their way towards me. So by the time I cried out, they were pretty close to me and they heard me cry out. But not before another wave came. 
and crashed down on me again and I went under, churning around. I didn't know which way was up and I had no more breath in me. I was about to open my mouth and breathe in water. And that's the last thing I remember. Everything went black. The next thing I know, I was on the shore. I had been saved. I had been delivered. God sent me a deliverer. My mom and her husband, my stepdad, Randy, after I cried out. But even before I had cried out, even in my pride, they already had their eyes on me. They were already heading towards my way to get me out of my situation. And this is where we find Jonah. Jonah is taken by the sailors. He's tossed over the side into the water. He's sinking. He's drowning. He's about to die. And what is he doing? He's clinging to his pride. He does not want to call out to the Lord. When he does cry out, what happens? God sends a deliverer that no doubt had been waiting there the entire time. God had someone ready, had, had, had a deliverer ready to rescue him from his condition as soon as he cried out. And that's where our story begins in Jonah chapter 1. With a deliverer, the fish, that had just been waiting for Jonah to cry out and save him and rescue him. So last time we left off in, chap, in uh, the very last verse of chapter 1, verse 17. Let me read that. Says, and the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. And so we see that stubborn, prideful Jonah here would rather die than turn and obey God. He would rather go over into the ocean. He's fleeing from God's presence, and he tells the sailors to throw him over the side, and God, in his mercy, appoints a deliverer to be at the exact right place at the exact right time. I have this picture in my head as I've been studying this week, and, and I kind of picture it like a movie. And if this were a movie we were watching, this is how I imagine it would be, okay? The camera would focus in on Jonah as he's falling over the side into the raging seas. We see a big splash. He goes under the water. The camera cuts to an underwater camera. You see Jonah's eyes wide open, his mouth open in a silent scream, and the camera watches him as he sinks down into the water. Next shot, we see Jonah falling from a distance. There's a small little person falling in this deep, dark black. You see he's struggling and fighting for air. He can't breathe. And finally, you see him clasp his hand and cry out a silent prayer to the Lord. Screen goes black in our imaginary movie. And on the screen, it just says, three days later. Now we see Jonah inside the whale. Somehow there's light in there and we can see him. I have no idea how that works. Don't think about that. The point is we can see him and he's inside the whale and he's praying. And he's praying a prayer of thanksgiving. And this is what he says. He says in verse 2, I called out to the Lord out of my distress and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried and you heard my voice. What distress is he talking about? Is he talking about? Well, he was about to drown. That's the distress he was talking about. His situation had gotten so bad that he had nowhere to look but up. He had no one to turn to except to the Lord, and that's exactly where the Lord wanted him to be. And in our imaginary movie, back to it for just a brief second, we see Jonah inside the whale or inside the fish, and we, we kind of take him back in his memory as he reflects on what was going on in his mind as he sunk down in the water as he prays inside of the big fish. He says this in verse 5, you, For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the floods surrounded me. All your waves and billows passed over me. Jonah says, you cast me into the deep. God, you cast me into the deep. Now we all know who cast him in the deep. It was the sailors. Why did he say this? Jonah is beginning to recognize where his sufferings come from. Job recognized the same thing. You remember Job? He lost his family. He lost his children. He lost his possessions, his property. And Satan leaves his wife there to harass him 
and you remember he's still trying to be strong, and you remember what the wife says, do you still hold fast your integrity? She says, curse God and die. And this is what Jonah says. He says, shall we accept good from the Lord and not accept evil? Jonah recognizes that God is in control of his circumstances here and that he still has a purpose for him. And that's how he can say, you cast me into the deep. Verse 4 says, Then I said, I am driven away from your sight, yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. As Jonah sinks down into the water, he feels like he's leaving God's presence. He feels like he can't, God can't even see him anymore. And what's amazing is this is exactly what Jonah wanted. He wanted to get away from the presence of the Lord. We're told twice in chapter 1 that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord. And now that he has his desire, he regrets his choice. He's miserable. Facing death has given him a moment of clarity where he realizes he doesn't want to be away from the presence of the Lord at all. And so he calls out. And the Lord in his mercy sends Jonah a deliverer. And so Jonah inside the fish reasons in his mind that if God has delivered him from drowning, he will also deliver him from the fish and he will see his holy temple again. That's why he can say that. He has faith in the future because, God, you have saved me from drowning. I'm confident you will save me from this fish, and I will see your holy temple again. Verse 5, verse 5 and 6. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped about my head. At the roots of the mountains, I went down to the land. In verse 6 whose bars closed upon me forever, yet you brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. We get a picture of the deep darkness that Jonah here is sinking into. I mean, I can't even imagine what that was like, sinking down deeper and deeper into the ocean. He says, I was heading down to Sheol, to the land of the dead, never to return. And that's when God reached down and lifted him up. If you remember, since the beginning of chapter 1, Jonah's direction of travel has always been downward. Downward, 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 downward. He went down to Joppa, remember? It's a kind of poetic way of saying that he was going down with the, the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa. He went down into the ship. He went down into the innermost parts of the ship. Then he went down into sleep. He lay down and went to sleep. And now he's sinking down into the ocean. And when he can go no farther down, he finally cries out to the Lord, and the Lord delivers him. God lifts him up. Verse 7 says, When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Jonah's running from the Lord. He wants to forget all about him. And now when he's about to die, now he remembers the Lord. A lot of us can relate to that. It reminds you of the prodigal son. You remember the younger son took his father's possessions and went off into the world to live out his sinful desires. And then when he's out of resources, he's about ready to starve to death. Then he remembers his father. Then he goes back. Jonah is about to die here, remembers the Lord. Verse 8 says, Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. I believe what Jonah is saying is here is, what good would it have been to call out to an idol in this moment? What good would it have been? See, worshiping idols is all fine and good when things are going good. You know, it's easy to believe the idol is blessing you. But when crisis hits, when tragedy comes into your life, when things get tough, the worthlessness of that idol is going to be on full display. You can call out, you can cry out, you can beg that idol, and that idol is going to do absolutely nothing. We see this all through the Old Testament. The children of Israel learned this lesson the hard way. I want you to listen. You remember the book of Judges? And the book of Judges is kind of a funny, funny book in a not really funny kind of way, but the children of Israel would worship idols. They would turn their back when things were good on the Lord. They would go worship idols. And inevitably, the natural consequence of worshiping idols is that God's protection is removed from you. The surrounding nations would come into the land. They would attack. They would pillage. They would take all their stuff. The children of Israel would call out to God for his mercy in their dilemma. 
the Lord would send them a judge, a deliverer. That person, at, while he was alive, they would follow. He was a strong leader. He would get rid of the idols, he would cleanse the land, and the people would follow him. Once the leader died, eventually they'd go right back, because things are good, go right back into your idolatry. Things get bad, they call it to the God. So this is over and over and over through the book of Judges. By chapter 10, this has been the pattern of their life forever. And listen to what happens here. Listen, listen to what God says about their idolatry in Judges 10. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord saying, We have sinned against you because we have forsaken our God and have served the Baals, which was an idol. And the Lord said to the people of Israel, Did I not save you from the Egyptians and from the Amorites, from the Ammonites and from the Philistines? The Sidonians also and the Amalekites and the Maonites oppressed you and you cried out to me and I saved you out of their hand. Yet you have forsaken me and served other gods. Therefore, I will save you no more. Go and cry out to the gods whom you have chosen. Let them save you in the time of your distress. The time of trouble, tragedy, crisis, idol is obviously worthless. And I think that's what Jonah is saying here. Verse 9 says, But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. So Jonah here says, you know, in contrast to those who trust in idols to save, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to worship you. I'm going to make a sacrifice of thanksgiving to you, Lord. And why? Because God has delivered him. He said, I will obey you now, God, because you have delivered me. Not I will obey you, God, because you are God, but because you've done something for me. Jonah still has a lot of maturing to do. In a few weeks, we're gonna, that's going to be on full display when we get to chapter 4. He's not completely a mature believer yet. And then verse 10, And the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. That's just a hilarious picture. I mean, I wonder if there was anyone there to see it. I mean, can you imagine you're sitting there on the beach with your family having a nice picnic lunch? Your kid says, hey, what is that, Dad? And you look over, and there's this big fish swimming up on the shore, and he opens his mouth and spits out a person and turns around and swims back away. So God in His mercy, at the end of chapter 2, God in His mercy delivers Jonah and gives him another chance. So that's the passage. Well, what does this have to do with our lives? What can we learn from this passage? How can we apply this passage to our life? I think we can do that by asking ourselves three questions. Number one, is there an example to follow here? Is there an example to follow here in the book? Let's look. Well, the first example, the first simple example is this. Jonah prays, right? He prays two different prayers. He prays one, a prayer for deliverance when he's drowning. And he also prays a prayer of thanksgiving once he is delivered. He looks back. And so when you come, the lesson here for us is this. When you come to the Lord in the morning, in your prayer time, take time to look back. Take time to remember and reflect on what God has delivered you from. And thank Him. Uh, another example to follow. Well, Jonah prayed Scripture back to the Lord that he had memorized. That might not be very obvious, but in this passage, there are at least allusions to the Psalms. Let me just share one with you here in verse 9. This is verse 9 of Jonah. It says, uh, but I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Now I want you to listen to Psalm 116. Jonah knew his Bible. Jonah knew Scripture. He had it in his heart and in his mind. This is what Psalm 116 says. This is just one example of many. I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and call on the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord in the presence of all His people. Do you guys hide God's Word in your heart? Can I encourage you to do that? When you're driving down the road or you're swallowed by a fish and you don't have a copy of God's Word handy and the enemy comes and whispers in your ear and makes you feel weak, he makes you feel scared, 
makes you depressed. There's nothing better than having God's word hit in your heart and in your mind and verbalizing it and speaking against that, preaching to yourself. And you can't do that unless God's word is hidden in your heart and you spent time meditating on it. Last example that we're to follow is this. Number three, Jonah, in telling his story, doesn't try to make himself look better than he was. Remember, all that we know about Jonah, his pride, his arrogance, his selfishness, is all contained in this book. Guess who wrote it? Jonah wrote it. And he doesn't try to paint himself as the hero. He's very real about his failings and weaknesses. What about us when we share our testimony with people? What are we emphasizing? Hopefully we're emphasizing the mercy and compassion that God has had on us as he pursued us when we fled from him. So that's the first question, those three things. Now the second question we can, we can ask is, is there a sin in here to avoid? Is there a sin to avoid? And I see two sins in here that we should avoid. First one is this. Yes, Jonah prayed, but he waited till he was in trouble to pray. The Lord tells Jonah to go to Nineveh and he runs. What he should have done was he should have had a posture of humility before the Lord. The conversation with the Lord. Trusting in him pouring out his heart before him, letting him know, I don't want to do this, and seeking God's wisdom and goodness. That's what he should have done. He shouldn't have waited until he was in trouble to pray. How is your prayer life? I think if we're honest, we would all say there's room for improvement. But are you trying at least? Are you making yourself available in case the Lord has something to say to you? Or do you wait till disaster hits and then start praying? The second sin to avoid is this. There isn't any confession of sin or rebellion or repentance in Jonah's prayer. None of it. There's a prayer for deliverance and there's a prayer of thanksgiving, but he doesn't bring up his sin. We need to keep short accounts with God when it comes to sin in our life. As a Christian, as a believer, sin should make us so uncomfortable that we cannot wait to run to our Father to confess the sin and be forgiven. Is there something in your life, some kind of sin you've gotten comfortable with that doesn't bug you like it used to? That's not a good thing. That is the way of the world. The Apostle Paul, this is what he said. Remember who we're talking about. The Apostle Paul, God spoke to him, literally spoke to him, saved him. He's writing the New Testament as he's writing these words. And this is what Paul says about sin. He says, um, But I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. The Apostle Paul was worried about being coming disqualified by sin. Our sin should make us sad and drive us to our Father who has made a way for us to be forgiven. We should not be comfortable with sin. And so this is the last, last question here. We had, is there an example to follow? Is there a sin to avoid? Now we have, is there a principle to apply that we learn in this passage? And there is. Yes, Jonah prayed. He waited till he was in trouble to pray. So that's the principle. Don't wait till you're in trouble to pray. When the crisis hits and the bottom drops out of your life, that's not the time to try to establish a prayer life with the Lord. Maybe you've heard that saying, the more you train in battle, you know, the more you sweat in training, the more you sweat in training, the less you'll bleed in battle. If you have a consistent history of spending time with God, learning from Him, hearing from Him, trusting Him with day-to-day -day decisions, learning to recognize His voice, 
when tragedy hits, you will be able to rest in your relationship with him. Confident that when, when a decision has to be made, a hard decision has to be made, they both seem good. Confident that you recognize the voice of the Lord because when hard decisions come up sometimes, it's hard to distinguish our voice from the Lord. But if we spent time with him, praying when things are good, when hard times come, we recognize that's the voice of the Lord or hey, that's my voice. I know what I'm doing. I know I'm trying to make it sound like the Lord wants me to do this when he doesn't. The second principle to apply is this. God is in control of your circumstances. And Jonah recognizes this. He says in verse 3, For you cast me into the deep. He says in verse 6, You brought up my life from the pit. And he says in verse 9, Salvation belongs to the Lord. If you are a child of God, know that whatever comes into your life, the Lord has allowed for a purpose. Don't have the picture of our enemy like he's as powerful as the Lord. He's on a leash. The Lord allows him to do things in our life for a purpose, if you're a child of God. And the third principle to apply is this. Don't demand your way. You might just get it. That's a hard one to swallow for us, isn't it? Don't demand your way. You might just get it. Jonah wanted to flee from the presence of the Lord. And so the Lord let him experience the misery of his desire. Look at what he says in verse 4. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight. Have you ever been there? Have you ever wanted something so bad that you ignore all the warning signs, the roadblocks God has put in your way, and you plow through them? You get within reaching grasp of, of this thing, and you're about ready to grab it, and all of a sudden you realize it's a mirage. It's not what you wanted at all. And now regret fills your heart. The best thing that we can do is to trust the Lord. Bring your Lord, bring to your Father your needs. Bring to Him your desires and trust Him to instruct you. But don't demand your own way. We need to come to the Lord in humility, genuinely seeking His counsel, genuinely seeking His voice. And you'll do well if you do that. So those are the three questions that we can apply, the thing, things that we can apply to our lives. And I have two more observations and I'll be done. Two other things I see here, and that's this. God brings life out of death so that others can be saved. Jonah was as good as dead when they tossed him overboard. He was as good as dead. But what happened? God delivered him from death through the fish so that he can go and preach to the Ninevites and they could be saved. And in the same way, every born-again believer has been delivered from death through Jesus Christ so that we can go into all the world and proclaim the gospel and people can be saved. God brings life out of death, what we were, so that others can be saved. Second observation is this. God also brings life out of death so that we can be saved. And this is how. We see in Jonah that the devourer the fish became his deliverer and ended up bringing him exactly where he was supposed to be. And in the same way as Christians, death, our devourer, has been used to bring us exactly where we are supposed to be, into heaven, into the Lord's presence. For the Christian... Death has been swallowed up in victory. Death has been turned on its head and used as an entryway into life. This is what Hebrews says, and I'll close with this, talking about Jesus and us. Inasmuch then as the children, us, have partaken of flesh and blood, he, Jesus, he himself likewise shared in the same. You put on flesh and blood. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, 
and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. God has turned death on his head. He brings life out of death. He did it for Jonah. He's done it for us. Praise be to God who turns things on their head and brings good. He brings life out of bad. He brings life out of death. Let's pray. Ah, oh, Lord, we just thank you for the, just the depth and the richness of your word, Lord. These stories that happened so long ago and yet they still speak to us, Father. You are amazing, Lord. You are creative. You are all powerful. You are all wise, Lord. Lord, I pray right now for all of us, that you would give us hearts that trust in you, that we would be so uncomfortable with sin, Lord, we would run to you with our sin and confess, trusting in your goodness, trusting in your wisdom, that we wouldn't demand our own way, Lord. Lord, we look to you. We thank you, Lord, for this word. We thank you for the book of Jonah. We thank you for the way you've spoken to us today. In Jesus' name, amen.